Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Trata 15 Techniques to Propel Your PPC webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference call is being recorded Wednesday, March 30th, 2011. I would now like to turn the conference call over to Elaine Ellis. Please go ahead, ma'am. Good day. Thank you for joining Trotta for 15 PPC Tricks and Tips for Success. We have a great webinar today to help you understand some ways that you can propel your PPC campaign forward using some really easy to understand and easy to implement tricks as well as a little more advanced. We're going to have something for everyone here today. We would love for you to ask questions as we go along through the chat feature, and our um, excellent paid search expert, Dan, will be answering them at the end. Also, uh, a lot of you will be asking if you can get a copy of the presentation. Absolutely. We will be sending a copy of the presentation and, as a bonus, best practices at the end of the week. Um, today we will go over keywords and copy tricks, some landing pages tips. We'll give you some uh, info on geotargeting and day parting. We'll talk to you about uh, optimization and give you a quick overview about Trotta and who we are. Um, and then we'll take your questions at the end. For those of you on Twitter, we'll be using the hashtag PPC tricks. Today we are going to be led by Dan Tisser, who has more than seven years of paid search experience, including uh, several agencies. Um, and then we have myself, who like several of you on here, is a rather new to paid search, so we'll definitely have the range of experience. And now I'm going to hand it over to Dan to discuss our first tip. Great. Thanks, Elaine. So jumping right in uh, to, to get started here, I first want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, these are really meant to be introduction uh, to how to best optimize your campaign. Even if you have never done paid search, these are, are some of the first steps that we want to cover about just getting out of the, uh, the, the trappings and the, uh, the, the basic pitfalls that we see uh, advertisers in our day-to-day -day, uh, coming across that, that do things uh, in a particular way. So these are just some different ways of thinking about it and really meant to be uh, an introduction to how to best optimize a, a new paid search campaign. Probably the most common thing that we hear is, is that uh, we have a lot of advertisers and people that we talk to that just do advertising within Google. Um, especially as of late, uh, what has now been called the Bing Yahoo Search Alliance. What this means is that Yahoo and Bing are, are still independent search engines with independent results. It just means that they have combined their efforts into a singular platform for a keyword buying interface, and they're calling that the Search Alliance. Uh, so when people opt in to go work in the Search Alliance, they will be advertising on Yahoo and Bing. Uh, what they're saying from their own marketing speak and, and from their own world is that they've, since the starting of the Search Alliance, which happened late last year, that they have seen a 12% gain uh, in conversion rates going up. And, and to take that from a 3,000-foot uh, view is that that 12% that, uh, that uh, relating to conversions is what the desired behavior that they've been seeing from their people reaching their website, whether that is a form fill out, a purchase, a download, uh, or, or simply visiting the website. Um, what they're also seeing is that the cost per click uh, was 20% below the industry benchmarks that ended uh, 2010. What that basically means is that they've seen a decrease in the actual pricing in there, which is uh, the individual pricing that is set at each individual keyword level. Also, another form of media that's starting to gain popularity, uh, of course, is Facebook. Uh, everyone it seems to be on it. Their advertising platform is getting more and more robust. Uh, and it allows to do some really neat things that they're seeing so much that is a 13.6% um, of online advertising spend is going towards that Facebook. Uh, the introduction to uh, real-time advertising as well is, is something that they've been able to, to do uh, starting. Another thing that we uh, recommend for, for getting started is to uh, add negative keywords and, and really embrace them. So to, to understand really what a negative keyword is, is that it's a keyword that you don't want your ad displaying for. So if you are a B2B advertiser and you have significant overlap into the consumer markets, but you offer a product for someone that would service a 
uh, a consumer market, this is a fantastic opportunity to use negative keywords. Um, there's great information out there from all the search engines of, of how to best implement them in, in the functional sense. But what we see as a, an overall benefits for using those negative keywords is that you get more targeted traffic. It's one thing to receive traffic, but you want to receive the, the traffic that's relevant to you. So using that same B2B business to business example, that you would be able to see traffic that comes in that's much more relevant for your audience. Um, what that also means is that uh, something that we'll touch on a little bit later is that you tend to get a higher Google quality score, which means that uh, Google is viewing the ads that you're uh, sending and the keywords you're buying as being uh, highly relevant and they reward you for that in uh, various ways. And then of course it, it's more targeted spend, that there's a lot more information coming in um, that uh, is going to be more relevant for the audience that you're trying to reach. And then ultimately what that results in is that you get more conversions. The conversion volume actually by taking out the information for, um, the, for those overlaps of those irrelevant traffic is that you get uh, higher relevant traffic that results in whatever that conversion is that we mentioned before, whether it be a purchase, a download, um, or visiting certain parts of the website. Another thing that uh, we see often, especially from new advertisers, is match type. Uh, often people will use broad match, meaning that a, a keyword in any permutation, uh, keywords uh, in front of it, uh, matching search queries, uh, tend to be the most generalized traffic. Uh, when you start to narrow down your match type, this is what we're talking about here. So phrase and exact match, uh, starting with phrase match is that it's the search engines only trigger ads when the keywords are, are phrased or matches. So it means that any, any words in front of it, any words behind it will be included uh, into a phrase match. Uh, some of the best benefits of it is that uh, the phrase match is just more targeted traffic. It also goes into that same overall umbrella of using a negative keyword that you start to see keywords that come in and then send more relevant traffic resulting in, in more keywords. Uh, exact match even takes it down to a, a narrower focus, meaning that only that one particular keyword will trigger an ad. Um, the pros of this is extremely targeted traffic. If you have a, a strong brand name that people are just simply searching for you, this is a fantastic opportunity to utilize a, a exact match match type uh, just as a, a general overall idea of how to use it. Um, format matters, and what we're talking about here is that we're actually talking about the actual ad copy uh, that we're writing, and we'll show you a couple of examples in the next slide here, but uh, as an overall rule, we want to, and this also goes down to almost basic English and, and copywriting schools if you come from the advertising world, uh, the use of semicolons in general, you're using, first of all, uh, a platform that has a very narrow parameters about how many keywords uh, should be used, and even uh, using the spaces down to how much is allowed to use in a particular ad. Using a semicolon means that you're, you're bringing in two ideas into a very short piece of text there. It, it's much more easy just to eliminate semicolons, keep your messaging concise, and of course make it very easy to read. Uh, as a general rule, we recommend using a uh, fourth grade reading level, just so it's very easy to digest, that people m will only be glancing at ads for a few seconds there, that we want to keep it a very uh, easy uh, to words to use and, and, and read, and then to best to have the audience be able to look at it for half a second, understand what is being conveyed in that text message. Uh, and then the, the last tip here is using title casing. I'll explain what that means when we go to this next slide. So title casing is, is using, is capitalizing the first letter of every word in a sentence. Uh, it's something that you see in the, the traditional advertising sense, um, especially in headlines, subheadlines as well. And, and we just find that it, it helps bring the attention to the, the ad copy more. And this is going back to real basic ad copy writing, regardless in paid search or printed materials. Um, that we just see that it looks cleaner, it tends to read a little bit better, it looks like it is they are their own individual headlines. And you can see the difference of just how they read, especially um, the, the ones across the top that you get to see uh, a fantastic ad for cheap water bottles, high quality. Um, you could even probably uppercase that low prices as well. Um, when you see that, that, that piece of copy below it, the BPA free eco, that it just, it just reads better that we have all those uh, letters capitalized. Um, looking down to the ad copy below that 70% off climbing gear, an example of, of not using title casing. It looks like you're, you're reading into deeper text, uh, and it looks so much cleaner when you go to the, the ad to just the right to that. Tense for camping, everything title cased, easy to read, 
a clear call to action, save now, which encourages people to, to click through. Uh, and then also you can start to use things that help free up ad space as well. One thing that we're also seeing in the lower ad copies with the climbing shoes and the camping tent at REI is that you start to see abersants being used instead of and, um, that you're getting the, the explanation point as well that works very well. And then also what I really like in the camping tent ad copy is the use of that plus sign. So an incentive, uh, a little, nice little snippet of ad copy that utilizes uh, a free shipping offer as well, which is something that REI could test on uh, and get to see that uh, it also includes a free shipping as opposed to starting a new sentence. Uh, it just reads a lot cleaner and it's, it seems to read like a coupon, which actually really brings us nicely to our next set of slides here. Uh, the use of coupons, this is something that we're starting to, to see get a lot of traction from our own internal uh, clients of ours inside of Trata, that what we're seeing is that they make a very big difference. It takes a branding campaign, turns into performance marketing campaign, that if you, you offer a very exclusive offer, only offer in your paid search ads, that we tend to find better performance coming from them. And you really start to, to get a sense of how well this offer is working and what is really resonating with your target audience. Is it a free shipping offer? Is it an inclusion of an additional product? Uh, different things like that tend to get a very good traction and, and tend to resonate very well inside the constraints of pay-per-click ad copy writing. Also what it allows you to do is do a data capture. And what I mean by that is collecting the email addresses um, for additional marketing efforts that you, at least you're getting an audience of people that are at least showing some initial interest in who you are and what you do. Um, and it can really help drive those offline purchases um, that you can, if you're trying to build business in a brick and mortar type store environment, that we tend to see that coupons will get people in the door and they tend to be very uh, exciting uh, forms of marketing, and especially in the rise today of companies like Groupon, um, that we see these very large companies that are, are doing a tremendous amount of business with just a, a flat coupon offer. To really get some numbers around it, uh, we actually have something from the, what I call from the wild, from the actual field of, of pay-per-click, is that we noticed that uh, with SoyJoy in particular, that they experience a 1.1% conversion rate. By any measure, that's, that's considered very good. Uh, as far as a click-through rate, but when they start to offer uh, an actual coupon for uh, a BOGO, a buy one, get one free, that they've experienced a, a tremendous jump in the click-through rate, uh, click rate, that it's going from 1% uh, all the way up to 8%, and 8% click-through rate is fantastic. That is a, a really highly relevant ad that is delivering uh, on top of uh, getting new people to the website, and that we are finding that uh, it, it's getting a lot more traffic to it that's highly relevant because people want that coupon. Um, and then really optimizing for quality here. So I mentioned before uh, optimizer, uh, doing optimizer work uh, within your campaign for quality score. So quality score is a Google specific product. Um, it's something that's measured at each individual keyword. And what Google is looking for, so despite that Google is such a, a big company um, that we are buying advertising space with pay-per-click inside of their AdWords platform, that Google, regardless of, of making a tremendous amount of revenue off of their, their keyword buying platform, they still want to deliver the best possible experience for all their users. So what they look at is they look at the ad copy relating to the keyword, relating to the search query of what people are actually writing into the, uh, the search engine boxes. And what they're saying is that if we're seeing a high percentage of matching among all of this, that Google will do a couple of things in rewards for delivering this best experience possible from a particular advertiser, is that looking at the particular keyword, they will lower the bid price, show it even in a higher position, and show it more often. Um, it's a tremendously powerful tool that is all based around relevancy. So as an overall tip for quality score and optimizing for Google quality score, is place keywords in the ad copy and landing page. If you are selling red shoes and you have a red shoes ad and a red shoes keyword, you should land that on a red shoes page. Um, as simple as that sounds, a lot of people point their traffic elsewhere on the website where people got to go hunt for this information. But if you have the ability to drive the traffic to a deeper landing page that is highly targeted around a particular keyword in ad, uh, that we find that the quality score increases and then you get all those fantastic rewards of the cheaper bid price, higher position, and more ad delivery. Um, we found this great example um, on this next slide. 
uh, it comes from Eddie Bauer, a tremendous e-retailer and of course a fantastic brand, that what we're seeing is that this free shipping of the search query relates directly to an offer that's going into the ad copy and then it goes across the entire top of the landing page as well. Generalized traffic, not looking for anything particular, but it's their outdoor gear page with the free shipping uh, offer, which uh, should result in a fantastic quality score for them. Another technique that we start to uh, see that, that people don't necessarily utilize, which is something that once you start to get some actionable information around what your pay-per-click is doing, is day parting. So day parting is an industry-specific term, and it's in short is delivering ads at a particular time of day uh, for your particular clientele. If you notice that you get a lot of traffic overnight but no one tends to convert, you might want to turn your ads off at night. Um, the best way to think of this is your traditional media outlets, just the same way that you can deliver a television ad during a particular program that has a particular interest, that that's the best time to get in front of your audience. Same with pay-per-click that you have the ability with inside of AdWords and then also within the Search Alliance to turn your ads off uh, and on at a particular time uh, a day and then also a particular day a week. It allows you to really have the ability to increase web traffic um, when your sales team is available, if you particularly have the phone ring for uh, your conversion metrics, that you want to have people available to answer the phone call uh, when you start to get those ads delivered. And then also it allows you to really increase web traffic on slow days. Uh, you will be able to see uh, traffic uptick that you might not be getting organically, but you can increase your overall site performance by, by running ads at a particular time of day that might not be receiving organic traffic. Uh, and then also it allows you to really understand how your uh, consumer works and it allows you to really optimize for the uh, actual conversions where people will reach the page and they will start to do. Uh, what they want to do, and then it really just allows you to maximize the ads for the prime sales time with their, you know, you have a lot of people that shop at work, um, or if this is a weekend activity, it's, it's really to best utilize how your audience and your target market works, and then delivering your ads uh, at those most important times. Another element that, that people certainly, it's another one of these kind of no-brainer type things, but you'd be surprised how often people will optimize um, poorly for geotargeting. So geotargeting allows uh, you to deliver your ads to a particular area uh, at a geographic preference, and there's so many different ways to do it. Um, oftentimes is that, especially in the search engines, you will find that, for example, Denver metro area covers half the state. You're going all the way up to Aspen and Vail, which is over 200 miles away. Uh, that is not necessarily a particular audience that you want to deliver ads to. So you can be very specific around how tightly you geotarget. Um, and there's, uh, in our next slide, we'll, we'll be able to show how specific you can really get into the geotargeting. Um, so especially going down into the, the deeper areas um, of bundling and excluding particular areas is that if you have a brick and mortar store, you know your audience is coming in from particular list of zip codes, you can go so far as to list a set of zip codes, you can set a 15 mile radius around your store location. And if you have multiple locations and they all have a 15 mile radius, is that you can also then pick and choose where you want to deliver those ads. A tremendously powerful tool. Um, and then you can even go down to even going very custom built into where you can cookie cutter the uh, particular states, especially inside Google. They do a really nice job of doing it within their, their mapping feature that allows you to exclude and, and really design your own custom shape. It doesn't have to be a perfect circle radius, but you can exclude particular neighborhoods um, and really get a feel for, for what's really working in that. And it, it's something that people will often will set and forget and not revisit. And it, of course, always provides a, a very good feedback loop into your traditional know-how of how consumers find you and when particular things uh, you want to deliver those ads to those particular areas as well. So even if you wanted to test a four-state free shipping, you can run a particular campaign against four states that allows you to ship things cheaply, uh, and you can be very targeted as to where you deliver those ads. Next, we're going to go into some good tips about creating good lead, um, lead forms and landing pages. Um, the one thing that we see that's really common is when people create a lead form, they really want to put together and make it almost a marketing research survey. That's not the way it should be. The only information you should be asking is what you need to make the sale or make the close. Um, the more questions, it, historically, you're going to see a bigger abandon rate, and that's not what you're looking for. 
And then you want to make it as easy as possible for people to fill out. So you want to auto-populate the fields when possible, have the input cursor move from field to field. Simple tips like that really make a big difference. The other most common mistake we see with landing pages is that your home page isn't a landing page. It should never be used. You're spending all this money and doing all this work and you're going to find that your paid search campaign won't be successful. Um, historically, you're always going to see your conversion rates are going to be lower. Um, your landing pages should be short and sweet. Home, pa or home pages are not. And then what you're really going to find with the home page is that the navigation is going to distract from the call to action. Um, you don't want people reading of your bios and you don't want people checking out your press release. What you really want them to do is one simple call to action. Um, and then landing pages are better at helping track conversions. And then the biggest thing that we see next is that people want to put a lot of calls to action or it's not clear. Like this PowerPoint, focus on one objective for each page. Define your objective and drive everything on the page to it. Um, and we're going to show you an example of all three of these together on this next landing page. Um, simple, easy to understand lead form, what they need, uh, great call to action, get debt relief now. Um, it's not a home page. And they're going to see a much better success rate. The other thing that um, you'll see is that it's all above the fold. 80% um, of people when they visit a site for the first time, they're not going to scroll down. So what you want to do is you really want to ensure um, the, uh, your t most important information and that your call to action is above the fold. Thanks. So. Oh, I'm sorry, is that you? No, it's you. Oh, it's me? Okay. <laughs> so uh, one thing that we often will provide is just a, an information that uh, really finds helpful to advertisers is that to tie their Google Analytics. So first of all, Google Analytics is a free analytics package that can work independently of pay-per-click, but also has a very nice feature that allows people to tie uh, their Google Analytics into their AdWords campaign. The, the main thing is that you have the ability to set up conversion tracking to be able to tie and, and provide a feedback loop as to which keyword is driving the most uh, relevant traffic uh, and really understand which keywords are sending the things that are resulting in those desired behaviors. Uh, it's completely free, easy to set up. Uh, all you need basically is access to uh, the HTML code inside your website. If you have a third party uh, provider that is working on your website, very easy for them to implement. It should be very run of the mill type of request that you get from them. Uh, and understanding how your spend is being used for sending traffic is one thing, but to really understand what people are doing on your website allows you to tie it in. If you're not running Google Analytics on your website, it's a very robust free program to really understand what's going on with your traffic. So this is a common question that we get very often. Uh, a lot of people ask us, how long should I be in an account? Um, how often should I be visiting things and, and checking on things, make sure things are working properly? And this is actually a number that Elaine and I have discussed uh, at length. And we really find it that once a campaign is live, a minimum of two days a week. Uh, if we just said, it's, it's not necessarily like this is the exact rule of where you need to be. Um, it really depends on, of course, how far reaching your campaign, how big your budget is. And, but we really find out that once a campaign is up and running, spending time looking through what those search numbers are doing two days a week is tremendously helpful. Um, we even were able to find some information as to really how often people are, are looking in here. Uh, the majority of the time people are, are looking in there daily, and this uh, really helped us you know, drive down to that two day a week number. Uh, tw uh, Twenty percent almost are in there daily, weekly, uh, thirty-seven percent. So you're, you're talking about uh, almost sixty percent of the time you're in there at least a couple times a week. It, it, things get scary when you start to see that twelve percent uh, and uh, twelve percent sitting on both the quarterly and the monthly. Uh, that is just far too long. There's a competitive environment involved in inside of pay-per-click that bid prices change, activity changes with competitors. Uh, other people might be launching a robust campaign, buying your brand name as a competitor. There's so many moving pieces inside of pay-per-click, it just pays to be in there uh, and, and looking at things regularly just to make sure that you're on top of everything. Uh, so that's a, a real common question that we wanted to address here. So another thing, so when you are in there that we start to see uh, people asking, you know, what are some ways that I can make some broad stroke changes, it, whether it be a new part of the land, uh, website's opening up, you want to test new landing pages, new offers are coming in. Uh, there's a couple different ways that you can do it. So 
Google AdWords has done a tremendous job of meaning, making things very easy for you to, to bulk upload. I'm actually going to skip around a little bit on this slide here. So AdWords Editor, another free program, sits offline outside of AdWords, allows you to do bulk changes, things like copying, pasting ad groups. Uh, so particular parts of the, the, uh, the campaign can be moved around very easily. Uh, taking landing pages out of all the ads, switching them around if you want to do some, some testing as well. Um, and then also AdWords API. So API is uh, basically the backdoor into side, uh, the search alliance inside of Google. It's actually the way that our platform works. This is a much more involved process of, that requires development and engineering bandwidth to go out there uh, and allow you to go work in bulk on a custom platform and they can tie into very robust analytics packages. So depending on your business uh, and size of your search marketing efforts and how big of a channel that is, it, it makes sense sometimes to commit engineering resources to go build out the API, which allows you to do custom reporting and, and make it the way you want to. If there's particular information that you're even presenting to a client or someone else, if you're running on their behalf, allows it to, to make it your way. And uh, the API is extremely powerful uh, and is available not only on AdWords, but also on the search line. So tying back into really how often you should be in, in your, uh, your AdWords campaign and your search marketing efforts, this really ties into that there's so many moving components to it that you constantly want to be testing what's working, what isn't. Testing new offers, testing new land pages, uh, ad copy is title casing really the way that you need to be doing it. Um, are there particular things that work really well that resonate with your uh, audience? So being in there trying new things is a, a constant uh, idea of really what's getting inside your consumer's mind and your site visitors and you'll really start to understand how to best tune a campaign. So you can start with a very broad focus, go after many different verticals, different audiences, run different times a day, days a week, different states, different countries. But when you start to narrow your focus, this is where this testing component becomes very popular to, to do as just an execution and you really get an understanding of what's going on with the people that are visiting your website. So bring things back full circle, we really wanted to touch on a, a few things that we do differently here and the things that I really like inside of uh, all my years of experience inside of, of paid search that we really find that uh, we find to be a very unique differentiator among all the different offerings of paid search out there. So what Trata is, is a paid search platform that buys search engine marketing, I'm sorry, search engine result page ad space on Google, Yahoo, and Bing through our own custom platform that utilizes those, those pay-per-click, which isn't necessarily the sustainable differentiation, but what's really interesting is that we have over a thousand optimizers that are paid search experts that will come to work on your campaign. Uh, and it allows you to really competitively build, optimize a very sophisticated pay-per-click campaign without doing the grunt work and being in the trenches of going out there, building keyword lists, testing, writing ad copy, that it really allows advertisers in our network, instead of being the person developing all that content, they now become the person that can go curate the content. And then if you are a paid search expert, we would love to have you in our system. Uh, it's a very easy way, especially for the people that are in the freelance world or have spare time outside of their agency jobs, or if they want to take a look at how pay-per-click is done elsewhere. Uh, we really want to grow our community and get as much diversity in our community as possible. Uh, so we have a uh, earn money on a pay-per-performance action. It's no sign-up fee at all. Um, you don't have to manage your clients of the issues with going out, selling a client, making sure that they're billing correctly, making sure you can get your money, and then setting those expectations. Um, that is all done for you. We simply want people that know paid search to come in and focus on what they do best, and that's creating the content and going and curating those campaigns on behalf of those advertisers. And it's a fantastic way to um, come and make some extra money. We even have reached optimizers that are full-time here at Trata in the sense that they are not employees here, but they are in our community as full-time paid search experts, which we call optimizers, and uh, they make a, a, a good living doing it just exclusively for Trata. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you remember the eight ball from your sleepovers of your, you don't actually get to ask the magic eight ball, but you can ask Dan for more questions. Um, about paid search and we already have some great ones queued up so just feel free to chat them and we will take them. One of the great questions we got Dan is how many ads should you have in your campaign to make it effective? Which 
that's a that's that, a tough one. It's a tough question. I, I would um, I would actually probably drill that question down a little bit further. So the the short answer is it depends. Uh, ideally, we would set ads at the ad group level. I would always recommend at a bare minimum testing at least two ads uh, to understand if there's different offers, uh, if there's things like dynamic keyword insertion versus static keywords. Uh, and different ways of writing those ads. At a bare minimum two, I would like to see four where you're testing dynamic keyword insertion against static copy against another offer. Uh, once again, utilizing the quality score, making sure that you're going there and building ads correctly. Um, that is all singularly focused and, and really optimizing for that quality score. Good question though. Uh, another question was, um, we talked a bit about title casing, but they wanted to know, should you use all caps in ad copy? Oh, wow. Like free yeah. all caps. Um, so all caps, you cannot use all caps. Um, that will get flagged as an editorial guideline inside of Google. Uh, Google is very particular about how they want their ads written. Um, you cannot use all caps. You can't use any kind of punctuation like a question mark even in your headline or an exclamation point uh, in using it too many times. So you can't use things like three exclamation points even in fact. So um, all caps is not something that you can even go use. Interesting. Now, how do you determine how to allocate budget between the different channels? Mm -hmm. For instance, Google, Bing, Facebook, how do you determine budget allocation? You know, as a default, that's a, that's a great question. That's something that we come up with often. Um, so the, the understand just to, to where to focus on it, there's no question that Google gets the majority of the search traffic, somewhere in the neighborhood of 60%. Ideally, the way that you want to go build out your campaigns is that you build everything in parallel regardless of where the budget is biased. Um, and that way you're, you're testing to make sure that is the, the conversion rate, the dollar amount, uh, the cost per acquisition of a new client or a new sale, is it cheaper on one particular network or not? Um, I would often recommend that uh, depending on also on, on how you do things in Facebook, but, but keeping in the realm of, of paid search, I would recommend that you'd start uh, 60 to 70 percent on Google, and then 30 to 40 percent on Bing and Yahoo, which is an all in that singular platform. Keep your content exactly the same on both. Duplicate your efforts on, on those two networks. If you're starting to see better conversion rates uh, come in from uh, the uh, Search Alliance, move your budget over slowly, see what happens. It, it falls back under that umbrella of test, test, and, and, and go test some more. Um, but that's a, a good default. And then I would, all, I would treat Facebook as, as something different just because you're engaging an audience on a completely different level, that you're not have an active audience like you would in a search engine result page where people are actively looking for a particular service or product offering where you get a, a much more passive audience there. And it's a different set of uh, performance expectations that come along with Facebook. Great. Uh, we have a question related to Trotta. Mm -hmm. Someone wanted to know, does Trotta provide a pay performance uh, service based on the actual sales instead of clicks to the website? Um, not independently. It's not something that you will only have to pay us for the actual performance of a conversion, whether that be a sale or that form fill out or that measure of success. The media still needs to be bought. So the, the short answer is not entirely. We do have a pay per acquisition platform that allows uh, optimizers to move certain parts of their campaign over into a paper acquisition platform, but it's not a true paper acquisition because there's still the uh, need to go purchase those clicks. Thanks. Uh, someone wants to know, what do you consider a good conversion rate for a campaign, 2 to 3%? Yeah, 2% is always the benchmark that we've used. It depends uh, on what you do. And when I say that 2%, if you are getting 2%, for example, on a consumer-facing product and the conversion ratio, meaning the amount of clicks resulting in sales, so it, it's taking it through the entire cycle of inbound visitor to the website, which was purchased uh, by paid search, all the way resulting into that desired action. 2% is a great benchmark. We see numbers that are still successful that are above and below that. If you have a very specific audience, if you're in the business-to-business -business world, highly technical fields, you might not get a tremendous amount of conversion volume, but you could say see a significantly higher percent um, of conversion rates. I always like to tie this conversation back into traditional media. If you were doing a direct mail campaign, um, or, or anything like that in the traditional media, a 2% conversion rate on especially like a coupon offer through the mail would be a, a tremendous number to, to reach as a conversion metric. 
And then we have another trotter related question. Oh. Someone was wondering what it takes to be a paid search expert in the trotter marketplace. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, love that question. So we actually have um, a couple things that, that we require. We want people to, of course, know paid search that um, are, are willing to work in, inside of our interface. There is a uh, fairly easy exam to, to go take that we require people that know pay-per-click will, will have no problem getting through it. It's more to just to, to screen people uh, inside of our system, and then we have uh, the ability to have new paid search experts work on campaigns that they desire to choose on, but uh, there's different things that we do to make sure that we are uh, progressively accessing the right campaigns to the right optimizers. But uh, we look for people with paid search expertise, and I'm leaving that kind of broad because there is such a wide variety of people that come in that have particular expertises. Um, but it's entirely up to the optimizer what they work on and when they work on it. So it's, a, it's a, an exam that you come in, you take a test, and you can find that on our website. Um, someone wanted to know, is there a preferred ad to keyword ratio? Hmm. As a general guideline, I, I like to keep my ad groups fairly tight. If, if I had to put a number on it, I would say no more than 20 keywords to start per ad group as a general rule. Um, and that's my own personal philosophy on that. What that does when you have what I call like a tight ad group at that 20, 25 keyword per ad group level is it forces you to build multiple ad groups, multiple messaging, hopefully deeper landing pages that are highly relevant to that. And, and from there, I, you can go out there and narrow and, and break up ad groups depending on, on what's working, what isn't, and you can break those apart. But if I had to put a number on it, I'd say 20, 25 keywords per ad group. Okay. Perfect. Um, someone um, wanted some more clarification about the Google Quality Score. They were mm -hmm. unaware that it focused on keywords and thought it only related to landing pages. So uh, maybe a quick explanation of how Google Quality Score is affected by keywords. Sure. So yeah, Quality Score is a Google-specific product. It only pertains to their AdWords program. So uh, to take it from the top, it looks at all those things. It looks how well so basically, to take it even from like a 3,000-foot view, despite that ad space is being bought on these search engine result pages, Google wants to provide the best user experience possible. So they look how the search query is triggering particular keywords against how the ad copy is written and against the landing page as well. So if things are highly relevant across all three of those, the keywords, the ads, and the landing page, that's how the quality score is calculated. If you look at the actual definition inside of AdWords Help, which is a really nice platform just to go learn about how AdWords works in general, Google's been fairly vague about their explanation. That The one thing that they keep on coming back to um, is that it's the click-through rate, how well the impression of the ad relates to the actual click and what that ratio is, and that's that click-through rate, it will probably be the best thing that results in uh, a high quality score. So the, the classic example that we use when we talk to new advertisers, if people were to buy the keyword Tiger Woods, um, and I think I actually wrote a blog post on this. So if, if you are a buying the keyword Tiger Woods, your ad copy has nothing to do with Tiger Woods, your landing page has nothing to do with Tiger Woods, you might get a tremendous amount of traffic, but you're not providing a very relevant search experience. So what Google will do is assign that particular keyword in that ad group a very low quality score. It's on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best, 1 being the worst. And Google will systematically bring down accounts and raise the bid price to such an astronomical dollar amount that it will essentially shut it down, and they will even go so far as to shut it down, saying that this keyword is not relevant uh, as a poor quality score. We are simply not going to run it. Uh, we have a great question about A-B testing, and that's length. How long do you A-B test? About a week or more? It's hard to say. It really depends on, on, on the buying cycles and the, 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 the site visitor cycles of that. Um, in some cases, it can be a week. some cases, it can be a month. Um, I would, if that came to us from a, a new person on our advertiser side, I, I would put, a, put that back on the advertiser and say, how often do people buy on this? What is your, your buying cycle elsewhere? If it's in a brick and mortar store, how often do you uh, see people come in going from shopping to buying purchases? And understanding those cycles um, really helps to determine what's working, what isn't. Uh, a week might be too short in some cases, um, and most, most cases it is. Um, we always live pay-per-click one month at a time, so if it's a a strong offer against another strong offer a, a month might be, if I had to put a, a, a number around it, and that would be more based around an e-commerce uh, advertiser that is consumer-facing. 
I love this question. What should a good landing page have? What are the key ingredients? Oh boy, yeah, that is a great question. Um, the landing page, it, it, so to use that e-commerce, and I keep on coming back to this e-commerce example for a couple of reasons, because it is the one arena that we tend to do very well in, and especially in pay-per-click, that allows you to track right down to a return on investment relative to uh, the actual cost of that. So the, the components of a, a good landing page um, is that the, of course, that the ad is matching the keyword and matching the ad copy landing on the landing page, that there is a clear call to action if you're an e-commerce advertiser, that you would have the ability to purchase very easily, um, that you're providing the most relevant information for that particular audience. And then if you have 20 products out there that you would have a landing page uh, individually for each and one of those prob uh, each individual uh, product, and then also a higher level of that as well as you can have what I call a disambiguation page. So if you have dress shoes and you have 10 dress shoes, you can create a dress shoes landing page with a variety of colors and styles and brands and allows people to shop from there and then click through into the deeper landing page with an individual product and a very easy way for them to purchase. We had another great Trotta question, and they wanted to know whether Trotta creates landing pages or websites for our customers. No. Um, the short answer is we don't. That being said, I mean, it's something that we talk about often because it's such a, a question that we get often that we have people that are saying, I want a website. I want it to be highly conversion focused. I want it to have good quality score. Uh, it's something that we don't currently offer. Um, there are some other companies out there like uh, Unbounce Rate that does a, a really good job of landing pages. Uh, development and whatnot as well, but uh, no, I mean, if it was up to me, we'd have 200 in-house uh, or optimizer generated people that are generating landing pages and building websites, though. So that's, uh, we really want people that, that come to our platform that um, have either done pay-per-click or have a well-built website that is easy to use uh, and allows a good user experience, and then once that is all in place, uh, you would want to then start your advertising programs there. So we are hyper-focused on search engine result page advertising for now. And you know, what I have seen to jump into that is um, our optimizers can communicate with our advertisers through the marketplace. And a lot of times they will give feedback um, for the landing page, which I think is really successful. Um, we have another question. What is what constitutes a good Google quality score? Is it you know five, six, seven, mm -hmm. eight? Mm -hmm. What's a Google, good Google quality score? I, generally speaking, I would say five or above. Like I mentioned before, it's a, a scale of one to ten. Ten being the best, one being the worst. If you're in the twos and threes, Google is basically going to be systematically shutting you down with either not showing your ad very often on that particular ad group, um, raising the bid price to where it becomes uneconomical. But five or above is where you start to reap the benefits of the higher position, lower bid price, ad showing more often. Uh, someone had a Google Analytics question. They were talking about how do you track ROI with Google Analytics? It really gets, I would even take that, it's, it's more of uh, tracking down to your conversion, your cost per acquisition. So the, the number of clicks and the why that ties into Google Analytics is that Google Analytics is really what provides that platform. What's really cool about Google Analytics is that if you are especially like a lead generation based business, uh, you have the ability to track, I believe, up to uh, uh, several goals. I'm not exactly sure on the exact number, but if people are getting into certain parts of the conversion funnel of a form fill out, if it's an extensive form fill out where you need to capture a lot of information, we, uh, you have the ability to track, okay, are people dropping off at the third step? Um, but it really gets down to conversion tracking. So it's the, the media cost. Uh, the, the amount of clicks that were purchased divided by the number of conversions that took place. And that's your cost per acquisition number. And that number should be uh, very well understood in the sense of like, okay, is this number too high or too low? You have a certain amount of money that's uh, required to keep numbers below to do a cost of doing business. And you can really understand the return on the spend uh, of what has been bought through uh, pay-per-click. Excellent. Uh, we have a good question. I love it. What is the threshold for determining a poor performing keyword in terms of impressions and conversions? Mm -hmm. And then the ultimate question, how long do you wait before deleting? Oh, boy, yeah. Um, I mean, if you're in the point 
zero zero one percent click through rate, uh, that's a keyword that clearly needs to be killed. If that's a keyword that also has resulted in zero conversions and is spent above where those numbers need to be relative to your cost of doing business, business and that cost per acquisition number, uh, that's when you start to need to really start taking down keywords there. That doesn't necessarily mean you need to eliminate that one particular keyword. Um, you look at that one particular keyword, it might not relate to that ad copy very well, so you're not getting good quality score uh, and getting that poor click-through rate. doesn't mean you can't, that that keyword's not good. You can break that out into a separate ad group, um, find other keywords that follow that theme, write a new ad copy, maybe change the landing page, and go retest it. And that really kind of goes back to that, that thing that we mentioned before, that we want people to be in their AdWords campaigns testing often, because things like that is a perfect opportunity to see a keyword that's not necessarily performing well, but that just means that keyword's not performing well under those set of circumstances. We have another Trotter question, which was, um, tr what is Trotter's um, minimum amount of budget? Um, and so what, what, what does it take to run in the Trotter marketplace? Sure. So I'll start, um, I'll put my sales hat on for just a second. Um, so what it does not take is that we don't require a setup fee. There is no cost to advertisers to get started with us, um, that we are on what we call a paper performance model. You are only buying the clicks and conversions as they come in. What we look for from a commitment from advertiser spend on a monthly budget is that we like to see $3,000 a month as a minimum. We just find that that is a number uh, that we uh, have seen just through going and working with uh, several hundred advertisers that it's a number that allows us to, to get the most traction. And from that also we look to have a 90-day commitment. Well, the reason why we have the 90-day commitment against that ad spend is that we are Presenting yourself out to that community of optimizers that certainly know paid search expertise, but they might not be a subject matter expertise on your business. So we do everything that we can on the front end to make sure that we bring in new advertisers, convey their messaging properly, understand their competitive landscapes, and then also understand where those cost per acquisition numbers need to be, where the cost per click bid prices need to be, and we go work with those parameters. That is all done before a campaign launches, but what we find is in that 90-day cycle that uh, optimizers will go explore a bunch of different things. Um, all that information passes in front of our advertisers for them to curate that content saying, this is good, this is bad, just from a subject matter expertise standpoint. And then you can start making numbers-based decisions. And we give advertisers the ability to pull down keywords if they feel like they're not uh, working properly, to reject ads if they feel like they're not relevant or going to the right landing pages. Um, and then also you, we provide the platform for the advertiser to message the community. It can be everyone working on your campaign saying, hey, we're seeing great work. Go focus on branded keywords because we're getting traction. So you get to harness the power of all the people working on your campaign. And uh, we require the involvement of the advertiser in there. But that 90-day that cycle is where we want to be um, at the end of those 90 days below your cost per acquisition number, sending you relevant traffic that's resulting in desired behaviors. Um, we have, a, it's going to be our last question so we can make sure everyone can get back to their busy days, but someone wanted to know what are some tips you have for helping people lower their CPAs? Yeah, that's, um, that's, that goes into that test umbrella as well. Um, lowering CPA, if, if you're getting, first of all, if you're getting acquisitions in which you hopefully will be um, when you start to go attack and bringing things down, which happens in, in, tr in the Trotter world. Um, after the first 30 days, if I could talk in general, what you start to do is you start to look at the keywords, um, and there's several ways to do this, but the, one of the first things I like to do is look at the keywords that are sending a tremendous amount of traffic that cost a lot of money, that might be expensive clicks to go after. Are those resulting in conversions? And if you're finding several instances of keywords to that are sending a, a lot of clicks that people are reaching your website, but they're not converting, they're not resulting in uh, acquisitions, whatever that may be, that you start to bring those keywords either offline, break those into their separate ad groups, um, and, and really take a look and say, okay, is this keyword too broad if I'm a, a small shoe company, to use a shoe example again, um, am I buying the keyword red shoes as opposed to am I buying the keyword that is red shoes from a particular brand in a particular style for a particular season? So there's, there's definitely things that you start to see like, okay, if you're buying the keyword red shoes, you're in 
you know, the world of Amazon and, and Zappos, and it's, it's highly broad traffic that's going to be very expensive. You want to start to look at the keywords uh, from people that are further down the buying cycle that are after a particular brand, that are after a particular size for a particular season, uh, and build keywords around that. And you'll start to see that those, those broad keywords is that you're getting a lot of site traffic and people might actually go purchase later on, but you want to get people that are further down the buying cycle. Uh, and looking for more valuable information. And you want to be able to provide those keywords there that aren't necessarily going to drive a lot of traffic, but the traffic that they do send is highly relevant results in conversion. Perfect. Well, everybody, um, we wanted to let you know that you will be able to receive a copy of the presentation, a recording of the webinar, and a bonus, a best practices brief. Um, including the information you saw today. We will be sending that out by the end of this week. In the meanwhile, uh, my information is available if you have additional questions, and that is it for us. Thank you, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for your participation. That does conclude the conference call for today. Please disconnect your lines.